Hey, there's Joe. Joe. Hey, everybody. Hey, hi, everybody. It's Jeff, Megan, Joe. Um, I'm just looking in the little box to make sure there are humans in there, Megan. I, I mean, think so. I think that's what the boxes are. There's a guest I think that's going to pop into. Uh, uh, that would be Charles. No, that would be, yeah, Charles and Francesca right there. That is. Um, welcome to Gunlock Bunch Shoes 164th harvest year isn't that amazing that's pretty astounding we uh have this tradition it's about a it's about as old as covid of doing a zoom tasting <laughs> in conjunction with our history so that's what we're doing right now that's um awesome. so let me tell you the theme of today the theme is sustainability uh in every sense of the word 164 years we're celebrating we can't really live around here without thinking about sustainability uh but we're going to talk even deeper about it um, that's because I've, I'm joined with people that know a lot more about it than I do, at least parts of it. Megan is our director of uh, sustainability, owns the entire topic. So once I'm done with the intro, I'm done. Joe runs all of our winemaking operations, has a, can you say hi, Joe? Hi, everybody. Oh, good. That was just a test to make sure I could hear you. It worked. <laughs> uh, and then uh, basically, Joe, I aside from making all the great wines here, is somebody who's very passionate about sustainability in every sense of the term. And then I'm Jeff Bunchu. Unfortunately, you probably already know who I am. Lucky you guys. It's, I'm, I get to do this a lot, but I'm pretty excited. And it's not just us, because surrounded here, I see Devin, Tara, Sam. I know that Marina, Marina <laughs> and uh, Abby are in there. So this is like the entire posse is here. And we have thousands of pages of content to prove it. Um, anyway, uh, we have a couple special guests to get to. Uh, first, the rules. We're in Zoom. We should be pretty familiar with Zoom by now. Uh, it means, well, this version of Zoom, we don't get to see your beautiful faces. So we're just imagining, at least this part of we, you all incredibly beautiful and scantily clad men and women. Um, and those of you who uh, can't see each other, you need to know that you're from around the country, right? All over the place. I just saw there's yeah. like, like most of you are in places where you don't need one of these, a spit bucket, because it's already well past uh, drinking hour. And I have this just for good measure. Uh, and then we, you also are a special group because most everybody on this drinks wine every day. A few of you get paid to drink wine every day. We want a special shout out to that group. Oh, there's Joe. <laughs> you too, Joe. <laughs> right on. Um, that means there's a lot of people out there that uh, help sell our wine. We're very excited to have you all in one place. But really what we're talking about is sustainability. And why sustainability matters to us is because, well, we've got another generation coming along and I'm gonna invite the first special guest to come on in if we can make this work, because I think we have a star. Is it gonna happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, I see somebody's, uh, let's see, you guys know. Uh, <gasps> ah! <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, my sister, Katie Bunchu, and the newest Bunchu blood, James Henry right there. Oh, look at that. Hello, oh. James. <laughs> James, uh, <laughs> is it, uh, do you like Pinot or Cabernet? Mm. What do you think, Katie? I think that he likes Cabernet. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he's definitely a cab guy. Full disclosure, <laughs> Katie actually lives in Napa. Full Don't tell people that. Don't it's okay. That. Napa's not a four-letter word around here. We love it. And even better, he, 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 she's married to another winemaker. Uh, because uh, not as though she has two husbands that are winemakers. I'm just saying another one besides Joe or her brother, right? Uh, anyway, you can see that she and her husband, winemaker Chris, have been busy because look at that. Isn't he... You know, I just can't wait till he's up here hosting with us. I, I, it's I know. his first debut, right? On, it's on the payroll now. There he is. <laughs> he, All right. He has to earn his keep somehow. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody on the call note that James is going to be on the background take, taking notes. Um, so uh, pay attention. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, James. Um, Hi, James. All right. A few things. Rules before we get to the beginning of this with the with the guests that I'm, I'm as excited about, believe it or not, as the baby. And you guys, well almost as excited about. Sorry, Andy. Baby's pretty exciting, but you're right there. A couple things. The Zoom situation here, you need to be on some special version. What's it called? 
uh, yes. panel gallery. Gallery. gallery view. So if you're not on gallery view, you need to hit the button on the upper right hand corner. That's what they say where they say it is. Um, and then again, keep those comments coming into the box. Okay, we're ready to start officially. Are, are, are let's, we? Let's because the going. way now the way this works is uh, we you know that we love music here at uh, Gumok Bunchu, and if you are around us long enough, you're going to see some live music. We've been lucky enough over the years to have a friend of ours play at the winery a lot um, and really bestow us with the gift of his music now for going on a decade. And he said yes when we asked him to open this show. It's something we do every time we do this. And um, we are so grateful. I'll talk to him afterwards. But for now, uh, this is my friend, Andy Kavik. You might know him and you will find him uh, under the, under the uh, nomenclature of Vetiver. And uh, he's going to start us with a song. Hi, Andy. Hey, how's it going? There he is. Andy. That's Andy. I'll, I'll catch up with you later after we yeah. hear from you. Okay. the sunset in the hills dream of my yesterdays and tomorrow and hope that you'll be with me still saw a butterfly Such a pleasant sound. Love is all around, and all I see is you. I must be in a good place now. I must be. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. First of all, that you got no one even know. No one around here even knows how much uh, that um, that's basically. 
I remember the first time you played that song here with Eric. Uh, I know it was the first time you did with Chica. I think they had that crew to film us. It was really special. And the uh, thank you for what that. House, wow, what, build, that, what building was that in? That's uh, that was in the bungalow, and bungalow. it was before the bungalow was. That's remodeled. right. That's right. It was sort of uh, so. It was a it, for those of you if you dig it up, you can find Vetiver and Fruit Bats on YouTube singing a duet of that song. And it really was the beginning of the live music journey here at Gunlock Bunchu. So you <laughs> pulling that out. Uh, yeah, it's Bobby the right spot. Thanks, man. Well, we really appreciate it. So uh, I know. Yeah, well, thank you. I know we all just saw how uh, how sharp you are on the, on the guitar. I know that COVID's kind of over now, but I, I also know that when COVID was going, you had a lot more wires and less strings that you were working on uh, the last time I saw you. How's the, how's the, how's the EDM career coming along? Uh, it's taken a, I think I've backed down a little bit from that. I, I wish I had been doing it a little bit more. You caught me right at that peak moment. You were like super psyched about it too. You were. I, I, I love it, but you know, then I hear that and I'm like, uh, you know, you're in your right spot. That's for sure. So uh, I noticed you're going on the you you have a couple shows coming up. Is that beyond California or just yeah? To, I'm touring the West Coast with Fruit Bats with Eric. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Yeah, so we're playing Ohio on Monday, San Francisco on Tuesday, and then our tour dates are on our website. But we're we're playing with Fruit Bats up in the Northwest and Midwest. That's awesome. Well, yeah. uh, we are so grateful. Those of you who have never heard of Vetiver. Uh, out there across the world go look up vetiver and hey. look up uh it's a, quite a discography and that's just a little bit of a sample of what uh what what andy and uh, vetiver are all about we'll see you at the tail end of this thing i hope i hope somehow you have some wine there or some tea or something I'm about to go get it yeah <laughs> right on well thanks andy we'll, we'll be Cheers. back at you all right wow how in the heck do we so uh cool. Top that. There's Joe right there. He's looking good. Joe's <laughs> I'm know? so relaxed right now. I can't even tell you. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, listen, we're going to get going on this. And that's, that's a hard act to follow. Um, so sustainability. I'm just looking at Joe's face right there. So, I, it's, it can, <laughs> so is there a reason it, to skin him, even though he's not talking? It's pure bliss over here. Oh, here we go. <laughs> there we go. All right. So listen, this is where we get serious this because is, you're, you're supposed that. to learn something on this. And yeah. I, we want to test drink you. Wine. <laughs> um, before we even get into the sustainability theme, uh, we like to start with just a reminder of where uh, we are. And I don't have my handy little pointer. So I will use my finger. Well, you can't even see what I'm pointing insane. at. <laughs> the bottom line is you see that little black GB? Thanks for illustrating that. Yeah, GB, <laughs> that GBW down there under the word, under Sonoma, that's the ranch right there. But I want everybody on this call and starting most importantly with those of you the farthest away from here who are don't get out here enough to pay attention to where that is. Um, we are basically halfway between the Golden Gate Bridge and Calistoga, the top of Napa Valley, which is really interesting when you think about it. We can get to, because of freeways and roads, we can get to the Golden Gate Bridge a lot quicker than we can to Calistoga. That informs uh, that proximity to the San Francisco Bay to our south, which is only a few miles from here, plus where you see the, the arrows coming up representing fog from the south, uh, plus our direct line from the Pacific Ocean to the west makes our whole hillside vineyard cool it defines all the asset of all the wines we're going to talk about today. Um, I just like to throw that out there because wine country is big. Uh, Sonoma within the context of wine country is big. And we are at the far southeast corner of Sonoma County, right? Uh, and the far southeast corner of Sonoma Valley, very influenced by those coastal regions. And we'll, I want you all to have that in mind when we pull up other maps to talk about the vineyard. Joe, does that make sense to you? I wasn't really listening, Jeff, so yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Megan, you? All good, yeah. All right, well, then there we go. So let's talk about sustainability. Um, I was thinking about this and how to really bring this up. Mm -hmm. uh, sustainability, when you live on a piece, of, a piece of property forever and your family's been here, mm -hmm. you don't really have it as a catchphrase. You sort of have it as the sort of only option. Right. right. It's right. like sustainability is like you don't have an, like if you don't sustain, then you're going to kind of stop. Right. Totally. And so uh, sustainability for us with a small S has been a part of our universe as long as we've been doing things. 
Luckily for us also, that translates into a crop that's relatively low input when you start out even conventionally, mm -hmm. though we haven't, we're not conventional. Um, uh, but it also, in our case, at least in my tenure here, uh, is something that as a term, sustainability that is, I sort of have been running from or trying to embrace, it's kind of a combination of both because you have, we interchange sustainability with legacy mm -hmm. and we have in our mission is continue the legacy, right? Mm -hmm. Make gray wine, number one, uh, make people happy, which is exactly what we're doing, number two. And then this third is, is continue the legacy. Sustainability is all about that. But for the first part of my career, and I get to represent the old guard here because Jim Bunchy's driving off to some godforsaken <laughs> place and bailed on us. God bless him. You guys can give him, you know what, when you see him next. Um, but given the fact I've been here 30 years now, I guess I have some credibility in the matter. Uh, but for, for those first 15 years, I'm thinking like, I have to live up to a legacy, not what am I leaving behind? It's like, how do you, how do you actually like live up to it. And those of you who know dad know that it's, those are big shoes to fill and a big shadow to step into. Uh, only recently, the last decade or so, now I'm like, okay, what are we, what are we really leaving toward? I, across that entire period, what's been most important to me is culture. And, I'm, and it really hasn't ever changed. I really care about the people that work here, the people that you represent, the people we get to share our wine with. That matters a ton to me. Uh, secondly is, um, our essentially our ability to, uh, you know, keep our 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 family kind of ownership connection intact. So, i.e., our business, making sure that we have a business to to keep going forward, and then knowing all the while that well, well, without fl flying the sustainability flag, that we care about the property. So we before we even get to what we're going to talk about, which is the this exciting new chapter of of, uh, of regenerative or organic uh, viticulture and living here. We were sustainable, certified. We, were, we, had a out, we had an outsourced organization make sure that we were doing it. We basically recycled most of the water we use here. If you've been here, you see solar panels all over the vineyard. You see our wastewater ponds, which are biodegenerative in terms of how they break down the water and make it reusable. Uh, we're pretty much keen on what goes on here, but we're taking it to a new level. Thanks to Megan, thanks to this idea that uh, there's something that I that we found, and it's also the royal we here that encompasses not just how we grow grapes, but how we treat the property and all the people who work here and all the people who visit here that then translates to the greater world, which we know we all need. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what am I talking about? So I think what Jeff is talking about. Here. It's very hard to follow. <laughs> Um, no, as you know, Jeff mentioned, this long legacy of a family has, you know, been sustaining this property for so long. And as we look toward the future, our biggest threat to that would be climate change in a lot of aspects. Um, so our biggest new projects in terms of agriculture is achieving a regenerative organic certification. And that it can also be called ROC. Um, ROC is this revolutionary new certification process for agriculture and textiles and personal care products, um, things of that nature. And it sets really sets the new gold standard for farming. And we, of course, are always trying to be the best that we can in our farming aspects of Jim would 100% agree with that, I think. Um, <laughs> so what Rock does, it really addresses the need to adapt to and mitigate climate change, all while recognizing that our systems are already currently degraded, and we need to rebuild and continue to build upon those. And what really sets it apart from the other environmental certifications that we are most accustomed to is the fact that we're taking our social aspect in to the forefront and that is mainly surrounding farm worker fairness and we lift our farm workers up as much as we can here and this kind of just solidifies that and gives us transparent transparency with our consumers um, it also boasts this huge soil health category where that is where we are getting the most resilience as possible in our land and for our vines. Um, the least possible intervention while building our soil health up 
in order for our vines to do their job on their own. And then of course, there is the animal welfare aspect. With rock, you are required to introduce animals to your property. So uh, we have definitely done that over the past six months or so. And um, it takes into consideration how you treat them and how they're interacting with your property. Um, so with that said, that's a lot to unpack and we are definitely going to do that throughout this, uh, time here, but, um, I think in order to unpack it, we kind of have to go all the way back to the beginning and to 1858 when, all right, Jacob. so <laughs> hold on, we're going to stop and talk a little bit about conversion meter first. Can you go back to that previous slide, Devin? Thank you. So, um, Couple things, three pillars, because there might be a test on these things, right? Oh, okay. That's I, I don't right. know when they're going to show up, but they might show up. Watch out. So these are important. And I just want to call out that, uh, and it is a call out because it's a call out to the whole industry. Part of what was attractive to me about this process, as it was with fish friendly farming before it, is that we had an outside the wine industry organization validating our approach to sustainability. Um, it's very, I'm very skeptical. We are very skeptical of quote unquote, sort of industry funded, industry mm -hmm. supported, uh, you know, certifications as much as I believe in the certifications that our industry puts forth and they're generally pretty good. I'm a hundred percent for having someone from the outside come in and audit us. And that's what we've been doing as long as I've been in charge here and that will continue to do it. We had farmed toward organic. We're, we're on the way to certification a couple of years ago, had to pull back because of some other issues. Not only is this leaning right into full organic certification, but this regenerative piece is super awesome and critical, as we said, because it gets everybody in all parts of our universe involved, which is, which is great. Absolutely. All right. So, so I want to make one little comment that you kind of made me realize I forgot that we will be certified organic for our grapes this year, which we are so excited about. And that is kind of a prerequisite for the situation that we're looking at here. And we are practicing all of these things now to kind of get ahead and be ready for the audit and get it going. So. I think that we're going to be the largest, when we're done, yep. we'll be the largest organic grape grower in Sonoma County. That is certified. Darn exciting. Yep. It's, there we go. So, all right. <laughs> we can show. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> so uh, let's talk. I mean, oh, I didn't even tell you guys, uh, ask you to open your bottles. I'm assuming you have some in front of you. We do. Um, and so we're just going to talk about what we have. You are welcome. You hopefully have some of these things right in front of you, but we also are game for you drinking anything else. Uh, old vintage gumlock punch, you chime in on what you're drinking, share it with us, share it with the chat box. Um, even if God forbid you have to open someone else's. We're uh, we're <laughs> lovers of all kinds here. So whatever you have to share, talk about it. But anyway, Gewurz Zuminer. We're starting with this because I, you know, along with a few other varietals, it's been planned on Rhine Farm for as long as there has been a Rhine Farm. Mm -hmm. um, I have some thoughts about Um, but I think we need Joe to talk about it so that we can bless drinking it because I'm getting really thirsty. Thank you, Joe. Go ahead. All right. Well, I didn't wait for myself. I've been drinking it the whole time <laughs> since you guys have been talking. But um, yeah, when I think of Gewurztraminer and Gunlock Bunchu. I mean, I can't think of a better varietal to illustrate sustainability um, in everything we do, because as Jeff mentioned, it's a varietal that's been planted here on Rhine Farm since the very beginning. Um, but furthermore, kind of into the future, you can see kind of these purple blobs right here. Uh, those represent the uh, three blocks of Gewurztraminer that are in your glass right now. Um, but what I really, really want to highlight is kind of that northernmost block kind of looks like a pentagon kind of thing right there. That is actually planted in uh, 1971 by uh, Jeff's dad and grandfather. And it produces one of the most amazing, um, not only Gewurztraminers that I've ever tasted, but wines in general. Um, it would not be something that would be planted today. Um, it's got this kind of, weird California sprawl uh, trellising system to it, but what it does and really, really wide rows, I think they built them to drive covered wagons down or something like that. Um, but what it does is really produce this really amazing um, Gewurztraminer that has the whole kaleidoscope of what Gewurztraminer can offer. Um, it's got tropical notes, it's got spice, it's got citrus notes, and it's all 
kind of wrapped together in this one block. And it really is, you know, the heart of what is hopefully in your glass right now. And, um, you know, it's what we try and capture. It really is what makes this, this bottle of wine so special. Um, and it's lasted the test of time. And special blocks do that. You know, it doesn't matter what varietal it is. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, maybe where it's planted. If it doesn't make sense, you know, by today's viticultural standards, if it makes a really damn good glass of wine, you know, people are going to keep it. Um, and that is, to me, harkens to um, sustainability from a winemaking standpoint um, entirely. So um, I just, I really think that this, this bottle of wine, starting off with this, you know, this topic that we're talking about, it's so important. Um, not only from, you know, a citizen of the earth standpoint, but just for me geeking out on a wine quality standpoint, you know, I can't wait to see what this does. It's only going to elevate what we do. Um, selfishly, you know, I'm just a little bit sitting back, you know, I, I love to talk and geek out with Megan about it, but um, it's, it's really her driving the bus and Jeff and the vision of the family. Um, and I just get to sit back and reap the rewards of, you know, all these great things that we're doing. Thanks, Joe. I saw I saw somebody chime in in the peanut gallery down there. Uh, the sobriety test in Sonoma is if you can't say there it is right there. So uh, there it is. It's Teresa Shaw. You can see that from here. Look at these. Eyes. Wow. Hi, Teresa. Uh, yeah. Sobriety test number one is if you can't say gunlock punch, you reverse mean you shouldn't be driving. <laughs> I guess number two is if you can't start a Zoom thing straight up, you, you have your own issues. Um, all right. So uh, a couple of things that you guys probably don't know. Anybody here? I'm looking. I got a. I got a. We got an audience yeah, ourselves right here. But you know that. Uh, so when I, we had a lot of varieties planted on Rhine Farm when I started, and part of what was happening was that there was this idea evolving in the world of estate wine growing that you figured out what few things you could do exceptionally well and you focused on those things. If you we remember the winery started relatively restarted after a hiatus of a couple of decades in the early 70s. And in the, in the downtime, which Megan will talk a little bit even deeper about, uh, there was basically, a, it was an ag operation. And the reason that, the, and in that case, you're sort of trying to make sure you have enough planted in the area to like weather all storms, which means if there's demand for one varietal and not for another, you want to make sure that you have a little bit of all in case whatever you have goes out of favor, another one comes in. So there was a lot out there. I came in and actually started cutting varietals out. And in addition to Gewürztraminer, we had these other historic German varietals that were a heritage that were came over on the boat. Uh, Sylvaner, <laughs> uh, Johannesburg Riesling, and this one varietal of which we only had four acres of. Uh, no, of which there were only four acres in the whole United States, and we had them all. It was called Kleinberger, and I cut them all out of here, and they're <laughs> gone, except for one Kleinberger. Man. But what, the reason that I did that was because all those other varietals were sort of also rands versus like their old world benchmarks. Um, they weren't as good, or as, or, or we, we couldn't make them as valuable as, as like their, the homeland, so to speak. And Gewürztraminer stood out uh, way above, shoulders above, to the point that we even swapped secrets and children, not wives, but children with the Trimbach family. Those of you who are into wine know that Jean Trimbach and uh, Hubert Trimbach, uh, I know there's some people on this call that know who they are. They're basically pioneers in Alsace. They, you know, I think it's tough having to live up with six generations. They have like <laughs> 17 generations, John does. And John came over and worked the harvest here and he ruined, he crashed my car. Oh no. <laughs> I wasn't old to drive, but it was my car. I was getting ready to drive and he took it and drove it into a wall after, 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 after a night of big harvesting, so to speak. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's because Gewürztraminer here is aromatic and it's incredible. And, and I stand by my choice, even though all the cool kids wish they had a little Savannah and a little Joe Riesling, but, uh, you know, in my mind, this is for us to make it, it's gotta be the best in the universe. I and this, this gets in there. Yeah. All I right. So I see Megan that you've got some like, well, I think with talking about our reverts, um, it was definitely brought on over on the boat from Jacob. Yep. Right. In 1858, it was, when we founded the property and signed this deed. And with the signing the deed came with the property, obviously. And this property here on Rhine Farm, 2000 Denmark Street, 
Um, we have about 195 acres just right here, excluding La Paz and Arrowhead. And within these 195 acres, 41% of it is native land and thir only 34% is planted. So I think that um, that is a huge, huge thing for us in terms of sustainability and regenerative organics. Um, not only does the native land allow us to maintain wildlife habitat, um, it allows the beneficial insect population to kind of be able to live on their own and self-regulate and bring themselves into the vines. It also pr um, provides biodiversity and all kinds of native plants. Um, we partner with Fish Friendly Farming, who was the first to um, certify as sustainable back in 2008, and they help us keep an eye on our invasive species and native species in order to maintain our native land as best as possible. It's called Fish Friendly. We have a creek that yes. runs a, the, on the on the northern border of our property, and so they have to. They're basically ensuring that the water that the runoff is clean, and by believe it or not, the teeth that come with ensuring certifying that your soil is clean enough to be within a sort of a fish habitat is pretty intense. And mm -hmm. that's why we chose to have them certify our work. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so another benefit of this native land that Jacob brought to the family, um, it as we move into regeneratives and adaptation and mitigation from climate change, it provides an amazing carbon pool. So for people that are not familiar with that term, basically all of this carbon in the atmosphere, we can sequester down and hold in our roots and in our land, and it makes it available for um, different plants whenever their biomass is growing, and it also can sequester more carbon. So this is kind of offsetting the work that we're doing in the vineyard that requires GHG emissions, which would be our tractor work and any sort of fuel combustion and things like that. So by maintaining this- Can you hold on. <laughs> can you just share with the audience um, what GHG is? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, GHG emissions, those are, basically any sort of bad emissions going into the atmosphere. Okay, I got it. <laughs> I, I got that contextually, but I just want to brag about the fact that you could drop that to all these people. It works out. And <laughs> see, Megan, you're worth everything. So good. <laughs> so anyway, um, the, the GHG mission, these are what's basically causing our, our, our at least our anthropogenic climate change, which is climate change caused by humans. So excited by these words. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's hard not to get into like the nitty gritty when you're talking about it. Yes. Um, anyway. No, I want you in the nitty gritty. That's yeah, exactly so, the deal. Uh, I wish they could see you closer because it's awesome. Um, and so we tried to kind of um, get the those benefits that we're getting on our native land, we want to mimic in the vineyard as well. So that's where our cover crops come in to introduce some biodiversity, organic matter into the soil. The living roots are sequestering carbon and assisting our vines in sequestering carbon. So that way we're working toward doing our part in terms of mitigating climate change and those aspects. So uh, obviously our vines are sequestering carbon year round. Um, but when they are growing the biomass and the leaves, it's bringing in more. And the same goes for in our native land. Whenever biomass is growing, it's sequestering more carbon. And with that biomass, it can be a threat for fires. So that's when we bring in our cute little animals and we got all kinds of goats and sheep and cows and donkeys, and they go out on Tolls Hill in our native land and break up the canopy from the ground, which is basically fire prevention for if the time comes. Um, and they do that in the off season, which is a fun way to manage our native land. All right, let's move to the next wine. <laughs> really? Oh, oh, trivia. Oh, trivia, trivia time. time. I wondered why we were there. Okay, what is, uh, wait, Sean, we have a- okay. Oh, I have a question from Sean. I think it's a, a good question. Go ahead. Okay. Wait, 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 you know what? Let's do trivia and then we'll and let's answer Sean's okay. question. We can't let Sean derail this whole thing. Sorry, right. Sean. Sorry, what Sean. do you think you're doing? <laughs> dropping something right on our lap like this. <laughs> um, all right. What's the trivia question? Do I have it in front of me? Oh, I do. Hold on. <laughs> Suspense is killing me. <laughs> you know, do you have it? I don't know. Uh, oh, here we oh, go. Here we, we go. have it. Here we go. Oh, got it. Okay, trivia slide. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> what are the three pillars of regenerative organic certification? I think Sean can nail this one. Got it, Sean. <laughs> the three pillars of organic certification. Do you I know them? No, they were just up there. I'm sure I could come up with them. Soil health, animal welfare, social. Oh, Kathleen, that's the, the acronym for regenerative organic. I know you, so I can say that. <laughs> I think we stumped them. Well, someone got it, I think. Oh, did someone get it? Oh, you're supposed to read. So the answer. Wait, but wait a minute. Are all the answers in? Oh, I don't know. Did somebody get it already? Checking. <laughs> all right. Well, we don't even know who the winner is. Okay. But we're going to, we'll all give right, you what give the answer, answer is. Soil health, animal welfare, and social fairness. So Paul. Just got that. I don't know who won. I can't even announce the winners because I'm pretty sure there. Sarah. There was got a, their heads together. And there there's a, a prize. Oh, oh, well, there is a winner. Her name is Sarah. Sarah, Sarah. you Sarah. get Heritage Pinot Noir. Okay, that's what it is. <laughs> God, the game show host of in this situation is not as smooth as you'd like it to be. But we have a really good question from Sean. I gave him a lot of. Right. Oh, yeah. It's a good question. Okay. Sean asked how. Wait a is... second. I have one more thing. Can <laughs> okay. we just taste some Chardonnay while we answer this question? <laughs> I think that's a good idea. <laughs> I, I, I need to take a sip. <sighs> All right. Okay. So, so, Sean asked, how is organic different from sustainable? Um, there's a lot of buzzwords flying around out in the world and articles and online. Um, basically, sustainability is rooted around. All of the all of these things, considering energy conservation, water conservation, um, mitigating climate change, using your best practices, but also um, that organic goes into that. Organic is basically what you can and cannot use in your vineyard. It's the inputs that you're putting out there. So um, sustainability goes a little bit deeper. The other aspect. thing, from sort of a you know, I guess a rule standpoint, is that sustainability. There's no like. Well, there is like certified sustainable. The way you get certified sustainable, though, is in the context of an industry sort of verified process. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a looser term. There are no governmental right. uh, sort of That's a good way like guidelines as to when and how to use sustainable. So you're not going to get in trouble if you do one thing and do the other. You can sort of self-police when you use that term. Organic is something that the CCOF, at least in California, I think every state has their own, but it's a it's a bunch of provable standards you need to live to live within mm -hmm. or you know framework with that you live within in order to mm -hmm. be able to call yourself that and right. that's 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 the main difference i mean organic is you're going to get certified organic you're jumping through a lot more hoops you're accountable to a quite a few more people uh and um so it's a it's a big deal but it's also a, a great thing right okay yeah we're moving on all right on. so uh chardonnay tolls clones chardonnay um we're going to get to Rhine Farm Pre. Can we skip ahead to the Chardonnay slide and we'll come back to that one? There we go. Thank you. So, Joe, start talking about this awesome clone here. Yes, um, absolutely. So moving on to a different unique purple blob, um, we're going to talk about the uh, Tolls clone Chardonnay. Um, it is a block. Stop resin. talking about my nose like that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'm the only one that laughs. No one else laughing at my jokes. Yet. I'm, worried, I'm worried about your circulation, Jeff. <laughs> um, so it is a block designate. Um, that one purple blob down there right next to the gate, if you guys have ever come up the driveway here at Gunlock Bunchu, um, it is a specific, not necessarily proprietary, but uh, specific to us clone. Uh, maybe one other winery that I know of has it planted. Um, but it is named after my boss, Toll Merritt, um, and he called it Toll's Clone. Um, he actually watched this particular clone and propagated it over many years because it has a specific uh, quality. And that quality is, uh, the French term is called mille rondage, um, but also in the United States and in farming terms, it's called hens and chicks. Debatable which one sounds cooler. Um, to but to me, they're both, they're both amazing because what it means is you have different size berries on the same cluster. Um, and most importantly, you mostly have very, very tiny berries. Um, and what that means is that you have a lot more um, 
sorry, got a little caught up there, but a lot more uh, skin to juice ratio. So all the most important kind of flavor and aroma characteristics in all grapes are concentrated in the skins. And so the more skins you have, the juice ratio, that means the more concentrated, the more aromatic, the more interesting the wine's gonna be. Um, and if you specifically are selecting for those particular characteristics in, in a wine or in a vine, then that's, that's what you get in our Tolscon Chardonnay. Um, it is a little bit, you know, compared to our Sonoma Coast, it, it has a little bit more new French oak on it. It's about 35, 40%, where our Sonoma Coast is only about 20. Um, it has a little bit more barrel age and a little bit more batonage. We are kind of trying to give it a little bit more of a reserve character to it. Um, but what's really kind of, I think, interesting about it is we only make, you know, four or 500 cases of it. And then the rest goes into our Sonoma Coast Chardonnay which comprises about 10 to 15% of the blend in any given year, you know, depending on the yields and things like that. Um, but again, you know, hearkening back to sustainability and the you know, whole theme of what we're talking about, this is really, to me, it's a, it's a heritage clone. It's something that you know, was propagated over many years. It was thoughtfully planted, and it is something that in the right place, you know, with the right soil and the right root stock and everything, and it's something that's going to be around for I hope a really, really, really long time. A couple of things about Chardonnay. It's something that uh, we do pretty well here. If you notice where that, uh, where the, where the block is, that whole side of the property, if you go up actually uphill from, from where that arrow is on this map and see the little, the little blue is the pond, if you will. And the pond is right next to the winery. That gives you an idea of where the winery or most of you visited. But this whole section of the vineyard is very cool. Um, it's got this Wichica clay loam soil type. There has historically been Chardonnay on the property for as long as I've been here and quite a bit longer. We've got our oldest vines are pushing 60 that are on the property there. And uh, though we're not technically in Carneros and we are technically in Sonoma Coast, we're very much influenced by all the same weather patterns and uh, that our neighbors in Carneros are. Our little secret is that same creek river that is uh lets us have a have a uh, like fish friendly farming has over the eons deposited a bunch of subsurface gravel so the drainage is very unusual for our region which adds i like to think to our minerality um but our chardonnay our estate chardonnay which is generally the one you can find out in the world is really good and it's a pretty good it's pretty good because it's made it's a pretty good deal because it's made up of a bunch of these very kind of uh well i shouldn't say a bunch but four very interesting clones of which this is one and it's really rich and the other three are are almost as equally compelling although this one's pretty special um great what do you think of this wine Maggie? i love this wine but it, it really toll the name toll really takes me back to when jim or no i'm sorry when toll came and took um charge of this property the same way thank you <laughs> <laughs> yes um, so, um, I mentioned earlier that, um, the rock certification requires you to introduce animals to your landscape. Um, so it's not the first time that animals have been on Ryan farm. Um, back when Toll came and took charge, he actually grazed Hereford steers over 20 acres of the property. And so we've reintroduced Hereford cattle to our fallow fields, which will be regenerating the soil um, before they're ready to be replanted again. But whenever this time was, this was prohibition, right? Mm -hmm. We had to shut down or we're not um, selling our grapes and wine, making wine, things like that. So he wanted to diversify the property and see how he could sustain his family and the land. Um, so he did a bunch of different agricultural project projects and what I think is one of the coolest is the, how do you put Sylvaner? Sylvaner. Sylvaner grapes. He had those, but he had an inner planted with tomatoes. And you don't see that no. anywhere <laughs> in, in viticulture. You don't see that anywhere. And Jim says that he only did it to the fourth spring, which that would make sense because that's when you're harvesting and turning those grapes into wine. Um, but I think that's super interesting. So, you know, he had oat hay. There were cattle and tons of horses in the valley at that time and all of these mission figs and cherries and apples they would harvest them and pack them up at what he called his toll sweat table 
and they would ship them off to the SF produce market and all of these different ways for them to kind of continue this um, legacy of the family and not let the land go to waste while we were in that period of time. I think so, so cool. yeah, I have a different take on that time in history. I was scarred. I bet you uh, were. <laughs> we had pears and I had to like, I, I have the earliest memories of me going my grandfather toll because toll is not the first toll. Toll was named after our grandfather toll. I mean, the toll, the toll that, that we, that the toll we, that we know. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a whole nother story that goes with that name. But the one, the, the guy that I'm talking about is my grandfather who took me at like, two in the morning to go sell pears down in the <laughs> farmer's market in, in what's now South San Francisco. And at that point, I'm like, I sure hope my cousin toll gets into this because I'm not going to be a dirt <laughs> farmer. <laughs> but the other thing that I also realized was, I'll never forget this. I walk in there and we're selling pears and we go in and by the time you get down there, because we had this truck that was like a 1950 something and, and it barely made it full of pears. We drive into the parking lot and then we'd go in to eat at like the at like so late it was like six o'clock in the morning before the market opened at seven and there were these guys like drinking beers at six in the morning and oh, i was like I i'm like grandpa <laughs> what are they doing drinking beer and he's like what are you talking about jeff it's the end of their day and i remember being eight and going they're just finishing their day and i'm eating my pancakes so they're drinking their beer it totally blew my mind but anyway, that's life on a farm that is a little bit different than the farm we have now. Absolutely. We'll move forward to the next uh, wine, I think. Yeah, which I is think Cabernet. we've got some. Oh, trivia. Here we go. Um, what was the large, look at this, look how good I am now. <laughs> what was the largest crop plant on Rhine Farm pre-1968 per the map we showed? We didn't even give them that information. Well, we I, I don't think we really grazed over it's the It's a total guess. So just start, you guys better start Ooh. catching the names here because we didn't give that information. It, they, we still have them planted on the property. Look today. at that. They're coming in. Okay. So you guys are going to, Oh, we got out. one. We got one. We got it. Oh, you got it. We got the, okay. Answer. So somebody won, but we're going to keep going because <laughs> there's only nine minutes left. And we've only gotten through two wines. Okay. Um, we'll move to Cabernet. Oh, Ooh, I get is, a break here. You do get a break. Nice. Um, check out this fancy map. Some of you who might were on our sustainability call or some of you may have seen this but in that within that black circle represents us the whole different part of our estate vineyard that you don't get to see when you drive up to the winery because it's around a corner and it's south facing it's on the hill um, but it's very important to understand uh essentially why we hang our hat so firmly on our cab and our merlot and all our bordeaux varietals that is the mountain range if you remember the map that i told you to remember in the beginning of the conversation where that little uh, GBW was in the context of the whole map. Mm -hmm. That was also the bottom of the Mayacamas range. And the Mayacamas are the mountain range that separate Napa and Sonoma basically from the top of the San Francisco Bay all the way up to essentially Knights Valley north of Calistoga. Uh, we are not only in the southeast corner of Sonoma Valley and Sonoma County, we're also on the southwest flank the southernmost western flank of the mayakamas mountains and it's that little space within this black circle where all this cabernet that was planted by my dad and my grandfather really separates us out from our universe because there's not a lot of other varietals like cabin merlot planted as far south as this that are this age and it's because we've been leaning into the acid fresh structure that is nowadays you'd call old world as long as we've been doing anything that's cabernet or or, or uh, Merlot related. The Cabernet, uh, you know, we make three of them. This is a, our estate one, Cabernet that's in front of you. Let me stop for a second here and take a little sniff. Sniffy, sniffy is a friend of mine in the tech world would have said a long time ago. What do you think of that, Megan? Mm. Do you got anything to say about that? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> so a couple other things you know before I hand it to you. I want everybody to look at the bottom of the Winkler scale. That Winkler scale, that is not the Fonzie scale. Just for the record, that is not the Fonz we're talking about. That is a joke that works. Yes. Uh, no, so what we're talking about is some guy named Winkler basically uh, mapped out the global regions, almost the bands, if you will, the belts, the bands around the planet 
where premium wine grapes grow. And you know, you have the equator in the middle, and then he sort of separated northern and southern hemisphere and began to quantify and equalize uh, growing regions based on the amount of essentially what we call degree days in, in a given region, and that so that we can compare it to everything else. And so where we find ourselves right in Sonoma Valley, Southern Napa, which is also down there, is much more in line with Bordeaux than it is with, say, Spain or with, uh, you know, Italy uh, or, uh, you know, and, or, or for that matter, even like Southern or, or I'm sorry, like Northern Chile or Northern Argentina. Um, it's a relatively, co it's a cool climate by winemaking standards. For the record, and this is a rabbit hole that I don't have enough time to go down, but I'm going to do it for a second. The first guy to identify the, the impact of climate change on wine, what he did was he took the bands, like I said, the bands of wine growing, and he applied the sort of the, the, the impact using the historical data of carbon changing on temperature to like 30 years forward. And he used like an aggressive, a medium, and a non-aggressive. And he watched those bands separate farther from the equator and going up. So as the as basically he pontificated, this is like 25 years ago, a guy from Oregon State or uh, who basic or Southern Oregon, I'm sorry if you're on this call. He basically recognized that as the planet got warmer, the optimum range for wine growing where you need this diurnal shift in acid would be farther and farther from the equator. And so you oh. go up like that. So, you know, if you are up Shoot there in the Okinawan study. Valley, there you go, you can <laughs> do that. Anyway, I, that's the rabbit hole I'll let you come rescue me from, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> that's not quite the segue with that Meg gave you, but that, that's okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah, it's, it, it truly is. And Keith, our executive winemaker, and I talk about it all the time, but that um, the environment, the Miso climate that we have here on Rhine Farm really is a gift. It's a gift for making Cabernet, especially because we have, you know, that cool climate that Jeff was alluding to, and it really just allows for hang time. And hang time is, you know, a buzzword. It's probably way overused in the wine industry and in trade and everywhere else, but it's it's a, it's a real thing. Um, it it just it matters that the grapes are able and the vines are able to metabolize things other than sugar during the maturation process. And that is so incredibly important uh, from a winemaking perspective because you know all that important work that Meg is putting into the soil and regenerating it um, gives you know the temperature and the environment that we have gives the vines the time to kind of assimilate that into the grapes. And it's not, um, it's not necessarily like you can taste the volcanic ash that's in our soils at La Paz, um, but it does allow for those, the best characteristics of the grapes that are planted within there to, to shine and to really be at their very best. Um, and what is truly amazing, and this is probably a little too much information, but we get to kind of kick back when it comes to cab and pick the grapes when we really, really want to. Um, a lot of times I've worked in Napa Valley wineries um, you know, where the, uh, the environment is, is pretty warm and that harvest window is, is very, very short. That's one thing about climate change too that is really affecting um, winemaking and grape growing is that the harvest window um, for certain varietals is changing quite a bit. And by that, I mean that it's, it's shrinking. Um, so there's really not enough time to get the maturation that you really, really want. Um, but we don't seem to have that here. And it's, it's really, really intriguing, and it, it makes a very, very interesting and high-quality wine. Um, and it does also in another, you know, different rabbit hole altogether. But that cool climate, again, also gives us really nice natural acidities. Um, so there's not a lot of, you know, messing around with the must or changing the way that, you know, the characteristics of the grapes that come from the, from the soil themselves in the winery. So it, uh, it's, it's really, really special place for Cabernet. Thanks, Joe. Um, yes. I have some information. Somebody up there asked the person's name. That did the study? That did the study. His wow. name is, and his name is Greg Jones. Uh, and you can, he even has his own Wikipedia page that I just found. Aren't, aren't that, isn't that awesome? <laughs> Proof that I'm not pulling this stuff out of you know where. Um, I saw him a long time ago and Greg Jones, I don't know that he's a doctor, but I do know that he is one of the foremost authorities on the wine on climate change and the impact on wine. Uh, 
and it was an interesting lecture a long time ago. And that was before there was like widespread acceptance that this was actually happening. And I went, saw that, asked my dad about it. it was, he would remember this conversation because we were going duck hunting afterwards. And he said, uh, and he said, I believe it because he talked about the only weather station around here is in Rutherford and Napa Valley. And he said that there'd been a four degree change uh, since the fifties. And this was probably in 19, no, in 2005 or so that I saw this lecture. And, you know, so he's saying a pretty big statement, four degree temperature change. And my dad agreed because he goes, he, but he, and he, and he, he said intuitively what Greg Jones had said on stage, which was, it wasn't that the days got hotter. It's that the, it's that the nights didn't get as cold. So that four degrees was about right. how things, so that it's a whole way of, you can just totally see it. I think too, uh, there's kind of a misconception about climate change and what, how we really see it in viticulture is, you know, the changing weather pattern, weather patterns. That's the main thing. It's um, we're having longer, hotter days, longer drought periods, um, infrequent rains, um, fires, fires, of course, Um, you know, so it's those weather patterns and those shifting things that you could typically look up in an almanac or farmer's almanac. Now that's it's not the same, not the same at all. I never believed the almanac anyway. Oh, Anything in a book a like that? Like, no, what, <laughs> come on, what do they know? I'm sorry, I'm allergic to dirt. Um, okay, so can you go, what's, is it, a, is it trivia? No, it's, we talked about Cabernet, is it trivia time? <gasps> yes, it is. Okay, what's, <laughs> what's the name of the actor that has some sort of weird temperature measurement? After, no, what, what's the name of the scale that we use to compare? Uh, I just gave it away. Somebody just told oh, me. Oh, yeah. That they're they're flying. I, mean, I mean, what do we think? They're in like second grade? <laughs> oh, Sean, of course. Sean, Sean Curry. Oh, okay. is he the one that yes. asked the sustainability question? Oh, now? and then Katie. Sorry, Katie Hansborough, you won the uh, other one, the previous one. So you guys are swimming in it. Um, uh, the Fonz the, the Fonz answer is good at special. <laughs> oh, the Fonz come in first. <laughs> okay, time check. We're 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 supposed to fit gotta, all this in to... an hour, yeah. um, and we're getting it's close. Tough. So, I'm going to invite everyone to stick their nose in this class, this Heritage Merlot. Um, for those of you who would like to try to sell this wine, you can't because we only make it and sell it ourselves. I think the production of this is very limited. It's very small, so it's kind of a special wine to get your hands on. Um, but uh, while we, before we talk about it, let's go back to those. You want to? Yeah, let's okay. go back right, right there and just right. finish this thing up. There it is, because this is important. Yeah, yeah. So, Sean, you asked the difference between organic and sustainability earlier. This is a good indication of really what sustainability is, and these is this is the triple bottom line of sustainability. You want to be treating your environment the best way possible while supporting your people and turning a profit. And that's really what the Bunchy family has been doing for 164 years. Except the profit part. <laughs> so that comes and goes, right? <laughs> and flows. We're trying hard. <laughs> so um, basically, this just all ties in in terms of we've been doing this for so long, but now what's different is how we are trying to address the climate change issue. And we are doing that with the, uh, through the means of regenerative organic certification, among other things. And the rock just really allows us to confront the bigger issues can, associated with climate change when you're talking about the people affected by it. You're talking about your farm workers, your employees, you're talking about how you're um, all your practices on the farm affects a bigger, a bigger audience than you realize. And so just thinking about our community, thinking about our employees, uplifting our people. And we really just are trying to do the most transparent, best thing possible for our environment and our company to keep things moving along. That's it. In That's terms it. of uh, <laughs> sustainability, we all have a few closing thoughts on that. To when we get past this wonderful wine that we yeah. finished talking about here. Joe Merlot. I know you love Merlot. Joe really plays it down I, with his teeth at some tiny little winery in Napa that <laughs> is known for any Merlot, and that would be Duckhorn. Oh, did I say oh, that out loud? <laughs> They're, of course, no. Go ahead, Joe. Merlot's been following me around my whole career, and I can't <laughs> shake it, <laughs> and it's okay because I love it, and it, it's a versatile variety 
Um, it's as, in my opinion, as expressive of terroir, maybe just second to Pinot Noir um, and a very, very close second. Um, and it is its downfall is that it is so versatile. And then, you know, we don't have to get in sideways, we don't have to get in all that crap, but, um, you know, certainly it was over planted in some places, so it, it got a bad rap. But in general, when planted in the right spots, like it is here on that purple blob, um, on the pause, LP2B, um, it creates a really, really special wine. Um, this is again, this Heritage Merlot is a block designate. Again, it comes entirely from the, the block with that we have highlighted on the um, on the map right here, um, and it's it's just you know it's it highlights when you have again the right grapes, the right rootstock, the right soil, um, the right row orientation, you know, the right proximity to San Pablo Bay, all of that kind of stuff, you know, mixing together to create a very very serious wine. Um, I would put this up against you know any Merlot that my former employer used to make, and I guarantee it would 100% hold its own. Um, I feel like, especially in Sonoma County, you know, where we have a little bit of a cooler environment, Merlot really, really thrives, um, and especially in this spot right here. So it's another wine that, or another block, I should say, that is gonna be around and with this company and with this family for a really, really, really long time, so. I'm happy to be a part of it, you know, while I'm here and making the wines. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a very special wine for me. Thanks, Amen. Joe. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it, we, we don't make a whole lot of this wine, uh, but we love it because, I mean, we basically make this wine, it, it made itself. The first vintage of the Heritage is the reason we even have a Heritage program at all, because it stood out on its own. Um, I think that it, the sun is going down on our faces right here. It really and is. So, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, we better, we better end this quick or else you guys aren't going to, oh, look no, at that. Here we go. It's <laughs> high production value. <laughs> they, they're opening the curtains behind us. <laughs> look at that. Oh, look at, look the at sunset, this. Now we get a sunset. Beautiful. Hey, listen, so sustainability, let's uh, stop sharing the screen if we could, please. And thank you. Cause we're going to wrap this up and I'm, we're, Andy's going to come in and finish this. Um, Oh, there's one more trivia. I'm sorry. I'm dropping the. We didn't talk about that. We didn't even tell them this. <laughs> Advanced what level. winery did Joe used to work for that also makes a love? Ah, duck horn. There we go. Somebody got it. <laughs> um, all right. So, okay. There's, um, we have some final questions and answers. Uh, you know, I think that the, well, let's, let's answer the questions before I wrap this up. What are, what are my questions? Okay. Where, where am I looking? If any of the oh. oh, any final questions? I'm supposed to ask you guys this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I hope you guys are just typing in like any, any final questions. There was a question about uh, how did, you know, Paul did ask back in the day, back in a, a minute ago about Milan Draj or, Milleron Dodge. How and why did we go that way or did we get lucky and, and end up with it? No, it's a characteristic of all um, Wente clone Chardonnay grapes. Um, it's just something that was selected for for quality, certainly not for yield. You know, I think most, you know, farmers of grapes, whether it, you know, they, they wouldn't necessarily plant that. But if you understood, you know, the resulting quality and what you could produce from a certain clone, you would absolutely go that route. And, you know, that's what made Winty Vineyards famous. You know, we're lucky enough to have a few really old selections of Winty. Um, there are more commercial um, selections of Winty available now that breed that out actually specifically so that the clusters are more uniform. Um, but if, if done right, it's, it's really what should be planted and it thrives here, especially, you know, in, in the Sonoma Coast. Oh, thanks, Joe. And thank you, Megan, for being technologically able. We just now see some more questions. Um, any so, chance? okay, do you have any interest? Okay, good question. Do we have any interest in, with the focus on sustainability, do we have any interest in changing to Stelvin closure or sticking with cork? That's Ooh. a really good question. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I, I 
actually have some thinking about this because you tell. add cork and uh, capsule, then you're then there may be equatable scenarios. But if it's just capsule and you're thinking aluminum, I've done I've done some digging on this. Like screw caps are usually too small to be recycled in a lot of different places. The process for making aluminum is pretty brutal. It is like uh, so we're generally sticking with cork but not a hundred percent. But if I was leaning in, um, I'm, I, I, I would like cork without a capsule, but we're not gonna do away with capsules. Um, so right now um, we sort of play it that way. Can we drive the Pinsgauer next time we visit? That depends only if you've had a bottle of Merlot alone yourself, and then we'll give you the keys. Um, <laughs> any chance we do an event on tour on the East Coast, that would be the best. You and I, we could go on tour. We could totally do this. Um, oh. Great. Oh, I see some great. Go to the there we go. A Wente gun bun collab. I like it. Uh, maybe. You never know. Um, all right. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I know that we have Andy's going to gonna play us out. Um, and Andy's we, probably and like, what's going okay, And before uh, he gets there, Megan, incredible job. You too. Uh, Joe, great job. Team. Like you don't understand how much work that goes into this. Uh, so very nice job to everybody here. Thank you guys. Um, we are lucky enough to, uh, we, the Royal we really, be surrounded by such great people on a beautiful place. Sustainability is like personal because I want to, this to keep going for all these people, for all you and everybody else. And that's, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of my family and really anyone that's around here, so. Here's to uh, sustainability. Here's to 164 years. 164. Wow. And he's going to take us out. And in, as in general, as in tradition, we're going to do a little bit of a wiggle party in here. So, Joe, get your booty in here. Get in front of the camera. Andy, take it. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Every day. Yeah. I'm away from you, shakes. Me up inside.
see him. Find him anywhere, Andy. Thank you so much, buddy. We love you. Yes. Oh, yeah. So good. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Happy D-Day. Bye. Bye.